Luke chapter 10, let's just start reading in verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. And so we always hear about the disciples, the twelve disciples. Now listen, there's more than twelve disciples. Right here, the Lord calls 70 disciples to go out. He had already called the 12. Those 12 disciples become, what? Apostles. All right? But the, these other fellows here, they are disciples. How does someone become a disciple? Well, if you remember the message from last Sunday morning, uh, I told you it, it takes more than good intentions. Amen? To be a disciple, to be a true follower of Christ. And the Lord said, it, look there, verse 1, chapter 10, verse 1, after these things. What things? Well, what did we finish reading there in chapter 9? Look at verse 57. And it came to pass, as they went away, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at my house. Jesus said unto him, no man, having put his hand of the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling those guys, you need more than good intentions to follow me. You have to be willing to forsake all. You have to be willing to forsake all and come and follow me and be my disciple. There are many, many people, thank God, in the world that are saved and going to heaven, but there aren't many disciples. Amen. To be a disciple, that's someone who's forsaken all to follow Christ. Right. And listen, the Bible says in uh, the book of Acts, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. A Christian is someone who's truly a follower of Jesus Christ. So there's many saved people. There's very few what we would term biblically Christians. A Christian is one who's forsaken all to follow the Lord. The Lord tells them that. And then after he says that, notice there are 70 that are willing to say, you know what, Lord, I'm willing. I've counted the cost. I've got more than just some good intentions. I'm willing to pay the price and I'm willing to go and tell others about you. And so that's what we see here in chapter 10. After the Lord proclaims what he proclaims, he still has 70 men at that time willing to go out and, uh, and tell the gospel to a lost and dying world. Thank God for it. Now, verse 2, and here's the reason, verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great. Is that still true today? Well, it sure is, isn't it? The harvest truly is great. We have missionaries coming in all the time, bringing their, uh, their burdens and all that we see. Listen, the harvest truly is great. If we just think what could be done in Baldwin County, amen? The harvest truly is great. And when you start going around this country and around this world, the harvest, the harvest truly is great. But here's always the problem. It's always been the problem. This always will be the problem. But the laborers are few. Why? There's few that are willing to forsake the comforts. There's few that are willing to forsake family. There's few that are willing to forsake the things of this world and the cares and the pleasures of this world to surrender to serve Christ to win others. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore. It's all by the answer of prayer. It's God's, it's just God's grace. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Amen. And we need to be praying that all the time. God, provide, 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 provide the people, provide the money, provide the time. It takes all that, amen, to get something done for God. And so we go on now. Look, verse 3. Notice verse 3. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And in whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. And if not, it shall turn you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things that they give thee. Uh, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And as you go to a town, you, somebody lets you in and they're going to feed you. You eat what they put before you, praise the Lord. You don't be going to this house to get some food, and then the next house, and then the next house, and then, you know. In other words, you just trust God moment by moment, and the Lord will take care of your needs. 
uh, verse uh, 7, In the same house remain eating and drinking, such things are give thee, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And in whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things are set before you. And so he's telling them the things that he's requiring of them as they go out to be his disciples. Verse 9, Heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the street of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable in the day of Sodom for that city. Mm -mm -mm. Now listen, he's sending them out. You know what he did for those disciples? He did the same exact thing when he sent them out. Look back in chapter 9, verse 1. When he sends out the 12, he's basically telling them the same thing. Remember? Look, verse, verse 1, chapter 9. Then he called his 12 disciples together, gave them a power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. And he said unto them, take neither for your journey, neither stave, script, neither bread, nor money, neither have two coats apiece. Whatsoever in house you enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust for a... Uh, of your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel, healing everywhere. Same thing. So he's sending out 70 more to do what he's already sent the 12 to do. And all his word spreading now. He's able to reach more towns and more areas. He's been praying, obviously, to the Lord of the harvest for labors for his harvest. We started with 12. Now he's got 70. Amen. And going out from there. That's what we want to see in churches. We want to see a church. You start with about a dozen and then see that thing go to about 70. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, uh, listen, I'm not talking about a church of 500. Are you with me? A church of 500 where you've got three disciples. Now, that's a lot of churches these days. Come on now. Right? There's a lot of saved people in those churches. There's not many disciples. See? You know what? Wouldn't it be better to have a church of 70 that were all disciples? Man, what a church that would be. Think about it. If you had just 70, but they were all true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Just sold out for the Lord. What if we had just 70 Sold out for God. Man, what could be done with that? So here's the Lord. He's sending out these disciples. Notice, if you would, what he, what he says, verse 13. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works have been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven shall be thrust down to hell. For he that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me, and he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. Now think about it. You know who the greatest hellfire damnation preacher in the Bible is? It's Jesus Christ. And he's telling those, those towns, and those places where they're not accepting Christ, where they're rejecting him, he flat out tells them right there, Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be better off than you fellas when I judge you. Amen. You're going to burn them with everlasting fire. That's what the Bible says. In everlasting fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ preached more on hellfire and damnation than any preacher in the Bible. He's trying to warn you about something, see? And that's, that's why we need laborers. That's why we need them to go out in the harvest and reach people. But notice now, this is where we're going here. Stay with me if you can. Please look in verse uh, 17. And the 70 returned again with... You know what they came back with? How about this? What they return with? Joy. They went out to serve. They came back with joy. Now, brethren, this has been on my heart for about a week now. Lord, really been hitting on this. I know God trying to say something to somebody or to everybody. I don't know how that works sometimes. Sometimes maybe the message is for one or two. Sometimes maybe it's just for about everybody. But the Lord's just had this thing on my heart all week, this thing about joy. You know what God's saying to his people? You lost your joy. You need to get your joy back. Amen? You better get your joy back. I know. Isn't God mean? Isn't he mean? Oh, God, he wants me to have joy. I mean, that's how, that's how God's people are sometimes. 
It's like, what are you trying to do? Make me, make me have joy? No way. You know, well, what, what, what? Who doesn't want you to have joy? Who could that be? Possibly, you think. I was just talking to Brother Trapani uh, over in Milton. And he goes to the detention center. And I'm trying to work on some scheduling things. So I called him, trying to work on our schedule for the detention center. And so we just started talking talk to him about that. We just started talking about some things, asking him how things are going. He said, I'm preaching this Sunday morning, brother. This something been on my heart. I said, what's that? He said, God's people are just miserable. They need to get joy. And I had this message. And I was just, brother, that is something else now. Uh, so listen, this ain't just here. Come on now. This is all over the place. Uh, listen, Ken McDonald, his wife, they're coming back next week. Ask them. Ask them what they're seeing out there. You know what's going on? There's just like this gloomy kind of uh, misery going around in God's churches with God's people. And it shouldn't be that way. God's desire for his children is that we have joy. 1 John 1, 4, he says, These things write we unto you that your joy might be full. That's God's desire for his children. Now, how many of you honestly came in here this morning full of joy? Raise your hand. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Four, five. Glory to God. The rest of you are out of the will of God. You're out of the will of God. Is it God's will for you to have fullness of joy? Then if you don't have the fu fullness of joy, are you in God's will? Come on. I don't know. I don't like the way this message is going, Brother Ray. You keep this up and you're going to make me have joy. And I refuse to. What is it? Come on now. <laughs> joy. How about it? First Peter 1 Peter 1.8, he says, re, we're to rejoice. We're to, we're, we're to rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Is that you? Is that how you came in here this morning? I know it's not. I've been in here teaching you all this morning. I heard you singing. Amen. It didn't remind me of the word joy. That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to be critical. You got to understand, well, listen, joy is something different than a good feeling. We okay? That's not joy. We, we get that confused sometimes. See? Oh, I had a good feeling. That must be joy. That, 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 no, that's a good feeling. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I'm just saying that that in itself is not joy. You can get a good feeling from your kids and your grandkids. Amen? Some happy times, good times. That's, that's not really what we call joy. You got to get the difference. Uh, ladies, you might get some new carpet in the house, new piece of furniture. Amen. New husband. And no, no. Um, but just something new. And it and it, you know, it thrills you. New dress. And that. But that's not joy. You see, uh, fellas, you might get a, you know, great buck this year. You know, just just fill up that cooler with fish. Right. That's a good feeling. But that's not joy. You got to get the difference. When we're talking joy, when it comes to a spiritual sense in the Bible, the Bible says it's joy unspeakable. How do you explain it? You can't. All you know is as a Christian, if you've experienced it, you know it. And you can kind of get with another Christian and say, man, it's good to have joy, isn't it? Yeah, man, it is. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, man. And, but even then, you can't. How do you use words for it? The hymn writers have tried to come up with words. To explain it. Preachers have tried many times in messages to try to define it. and get it's, it's impossible. The Bible says it's unspeakable. There's a glow. That's all you can explain. It's like a, a pregnant woman. Try to explain that. See? When a lady's pregnant, she has that, you know what I mean? She had that, she had that touch, that glow about, you know what I mean? How do you explain it? How do you put it in words? I don't know how. How do you explain blue to a blind person? It, it, see, you have to experience for yourself. That's the only way you can understand it. And if you've ever been filled with the Holy Spirit of God, then you know something about joy. Amen. And it's good to have joy. The Lord's desire for us is to have that inner expression of joy, that glow. Now, it is not, listen, this is what it's not. Let me show you here. Look at verse, look at verse 17. The 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject us unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, oh, that's nothing. I, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So what? You cast a few demons out. I was there when, phew, 
He had, he had to leave. I cast Satan himself down. See? He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You know what he's telling them? Hey, it ain't this charismatic garbage. Yeah. Oh, we cast out demons, you know. Oh, hallelujah. No, that ain't it. That ain't the joy the Lord's talking about. It ain't whatever his name is there from Australia talking about getting a belly out of your bubble and everybody's laughing. And they got this laughing gas, Holy Spirit thing that they're talking about. That ain't it. It ain't goofiness. Amen. That's not the joy of the Bible. That's not what God's talking about. See, when he goes, Rodney, that's his name, Brother Rodney. I think that's what his name is. And, and he, he wants you to get a, a, a you got to get a bubble out of your belly. And, and then you'll just start laughing uncontrollably. And that, that shows that you have the Holy Spirit. And you just have that heavenly laughter and whatever that is. And you have a joy that, no, that ain't it. See, that, that's not the joy that the Bible's talking about, but God desires, it's God's will for you and I to have joy. I'm sorry to burst your bubble on that. I know some of you came in here with intents of not having joy, of leaving here with intents of not having joy, with making sure you go through the whole next week without any joy. I know that's your intentions, and it's my job this morning to just destroy all your plans. And make you leave here today with the joy of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, do you apologize for that, Brother Ray? Not at all. Not at all. I don't even feel a little bad about it. Amen. Uh, and uh, do you want to feel bad about that? If some of you right now are going to put up that wall and say, there ain't no way you're going to... Well, help yourself. That's all I can say. Help yourself. Amen. Nothing I can do for you. Uh, I, you know, I can only help those that want help. That's the way that goes. Uh, but God's desire is for his children to rejoice, to have that joy. Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 15 and verse 11 said, These things I have spoken unto you that your joy might be full. What's God's will for you? There's no doubt about it. Amen. He said in John 16, 24, ask and you receive and receive that your joy might be full. The apostle John says in 2 John 12, that I might come unto you that your joy may be full over and over and over again in the Bible. God's telling his people, I want you to have fullness of joy. You got to have joy. You got to have joy. Amen. Uh, some Christians, I don't know what it is. They just refuse. They just refuse to have joy. And then you know what they'll do? They'll always blame it on somebody else. Well, I'm not allowed to have joy because of him. I refuse to be joyful because of her. You know what they never do? They're never able to look in the mirror and find out what the real problem is. Amen. That's the real problem. Now, come on. That's the truth. Uh, there was a fellow, he was, he was stuck on a deserted island for like seven, eight years. And finally, he sees this big old cruise ship coming by about four miles off. And, oh, man, he sees that thing and he grabs a bunch of palm leaves and everything, puts them all together, makes a pile and, and, and strikes that flint. And he gets that fire going and he, and he starts going like this with his shirt on that smoke, trying to attract that cruise ship. And he's waving up and down. And finally, that thing sees him and starts turning around. Next thing you know, here comes a few fellows up to him on a little boat and they come on up there and they say, we're come here to rescue. He says, well, thank God. Thank God. Thank you so much. And they asked and they said, well, are there other people on the island here with you? And he says, no, I'm here all by myself. And he says, then, then why are there three huts? Why did you build three huts if it's just you here? And he says, oh, well, that one is my house. And that one is my church. And they say, oh, okay, all right. But then what's the third one? He says, well, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, say, say, what? Who is he going to blame that on? Well, that's, that's Christians. That's people. That's how they are. Amen. Come on. Uh, now, listen, the Lord tells us right here the, the things, some things we can do as his people to have joy. Title of the message this morning. Real, real simple. You can put it two ways. Number one, reasons to rejoice or how to have joy. Take your pick. Either title works for me. Now, uh, if you would look there in verse 17, first thing we see, what do we see? Verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy. What have they been doing? They've been preaching. 
They've been talking to others about the Lord. Hey, Christian, you want to have some joy? You want to have some joy? I can tell you how to have joy. You ever start feeling down in the mouth? You ever start feeling, you know what you need to do? You need to go tell someone about Jesus Christ. Amen. Best thing you can do, man, to have some joy is get out and tell someone about the Lord. But I can still remember the first, the first time I ever went witnessing. I didn't win anybody to Christ. But I went, another fellow there that I ran into at a Bible study, he was a Christian. And, and I was saying, I want to learn how to be a soul winner. I want to learn how to tell others about Jesus. I've been saved about three or four weeks. I had a desire to tell others. I didn't know how to do it. And he said, well, why don't you come with me? We'll go to downtown New London. We'll hand out some tracts and talk to some people about the Lord. I said, wonderful. Let's do that. So I go down there with him. We go down down New London. We got a pocket full of chick tracts and a Bible. And I go down there and, and I started, I, would you like a track? No, no. Would you like a track? No, no, no. Would you like a track? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. How about you? Would you well, I don't know. Okay, well, amen. And how about you? And again, when the, and then I got a chance to actually start talking to somebody for a few minutes. And then I ran into another fellow, and he was an atheist, and we kind of got into it for a little bit, and then done with that. And then I went over to this fellow and talked to him for a little while. And, and nobody got saved, but you know what? When I was done, we were done. We were down there for about three hours, and it seemed like it took about 15 minutes. And when we got done, and we're driving back, and, and here's someone walking down the road, I said, man, pull over. And I go out there, and I give that person a track. I just, man, I got infected. Amen. Been infected ever since. Praise God. But you know what? When I went back there, that, that whole time, I was just floating. Buddy, I just had such, you know what it was? Listen, you go out there and you start telling others about the Lord. The Lord just fills you with his spirit. And the result of that, what's the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy. You can't help but have joy when you're out there trying to tell others, trying to be a light for the Lord, trying to talk to others about Jesus Christ. It's just an automatic thing, man. You'll have that joy. I can remember the first guy ever led to the Lord. Been saved a couple months there. And, and uh, Daryl Cooley, he grew up probably about a half an hour away from me. Never met him, but in the Coast Guard, here we are stationed together. We went to school together. And uh, anyway, I, I, I got with Daryl. I said, I'd like to really talk to you about what the Lord's done for me. And he said, well, yeah, sure. No problem. Now, most of the people you've done that and they're like, get away from me, plague, you know. But he said, yeah, no problem. So I'm all excited. I'm all excited. I got one that's willing to talk to me. And he came, I drew him a picture. You all see me draw. I'm thinking if I draw a picture, I can help this fellow. Do you realize how gracious God is? You realize, you look back, you realize, you know, it was all God. At the time, you think you're doing something, but you realize it's all God. But anyway, I have this picture, and it's a guy, and he's in a house in a burning building. And I said, what would you do for that fellow? What kind of a person would I be if I didn't warn him? He's there sleeping in that bed. And he doesn't even realize that his house on fire. He's going to burn if someone doesn't tell him. That's how I started the conversation. And then I got to just show him some verses out of the Bible. Show him a track. Went through a track together. You won't get saved. Yeah, I do. Whew. I got to lead that fellow to the Lord, man. Been saved about two months. Got to lead that fellow to the Lord. You, you want to talk about cloud nine, man. You want to talk about joy. I mean, my feet didn't touch the ground for at least three or four days after that, I'm sure. Amen. Say, what was that? Listen, you just go out there and start telling others about Jesus. You'll have joy. You can't help it. Uh, what's the fellow's name? Uh, uh, his name escaped me. The fellow that, that dropped the, the, all the tracks over the Vatican and, and wrote the book on it. Bill Eubanks, he used to be a, uh, a card shark and dealer and all that in Vegas, got saved. And that's all he does. He's an evangelist. All he does is win people to God, tell people about Jesus all the time. There's one thing you know about that fellow, if you don't know anything else, he's got joy. That fellow, I've never seen that fellow not have a smile, not just be excited about living for God. Listen, why? He's just out telling people about Jesus. You can't help, you can't be miserable if you're talking to people about the Lord all the time. It's impossible. Amen. Uh, you know what happens? Listen, this is what happens. This is the key. You know what happens when you're doing that? You get your mind off your own stinking problems. You get your mind off yourself and how bad you got it and all the terrible things going on in your life. And you start letting God use you to help out somebody else and reach somebody else. You know what? You'll have joy. How about it? You want to have some joy? Why don't you talk to someone else about Jesus Christ? You'll be filled with the Holy Ghost, man. You get filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll have joy. Simple as that. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Amen. You got to have joy. 
You got to have joy. You got to have joy. Amen. Uh, you know what you need to do? You, re you need to remind yourself. Listen, you need to remind yourself sometimes of where it is you're going. Anybody in here going to heaven? If you're going to heaven, raise your hand. I'm just curious. Anybody in here? Oh, and out of the, and out of that many, how many of you came in here with fullness of joy this morning? Now come on! You're going to heaven. Look, look what Jesus said. What did he say? Uh, verse uh, twenty. Verse twenty. Look at verse twenty. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice. Why? Because your names are written in heaven. Is that you? Is that your name? Amen. You already got a mailbox, a P.O. box or something already up there with your name on it in heaven, right? That's what the Lord said. Your name is written up there. You're as good as there. Ephesians says we're seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you. I'm going to heaven. Amen. And you can't stop it. And I can't stop it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it good to know you're going to heaven? Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. But preacher, you don't understand. I've been having trouble paying my bills. So? Isn't that all the more reason to be glad that you're going to heaven? You're not going uh, where Jesus is talking about here, verse 12, 13, 14. You're not going to get burned. You're going to heaven. You're going to live eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ in a sinless, perfect, incorruptible body. How about it? Is that a reason to rejoice? Glory to God, man. It ought to be. Look, look, uh, hold, hold your place. Excuse me, hold your place here. Look with me in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now look at this, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and what the Bible has to say about this thing of rejoicing when it comes to eternal things. Uh, uh, Paul said, our conversation is in heaven. Amen? Everything about our lives, our walk, our talk, everything about us is, should be about heaven. He says, set your affections on things above. Not on things on this earth. Your whole life, your mind, everything that you're looking forward to, everything you love should be about heaven, about eternal things. Is that what it is? Listen, if that's what it is, how could you not help but have joy? Now look with me there in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the joy that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's our example. That's who we're looking at. He's our, he's our starting line. He's the finish line. Who? For the joy. Now watch this. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus didn't go to the cross saying, oh, isn't this wonderful? I have such joy knowing I get to go to the cross. No. That was something he was going to have to endure. That was something he wasn't looking forward to. He's praying in the garden, Father, if there be any other way. He's not looking forward to that. But you know why he was able to go through it? With joy? Because he was looking forward to the joy that was set before him. He's our example. That's what just said. If you're going to finish this race, and if you're going to finish this race with joy, you're going to have to do what Jesus did. You know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to keep looking forward to what's before you. What's before you? Jesus. That's the finish line. Hey, at the finish line, it might be Jesus. Listen, pray for Sister Helen. She's in the hospital. She's not doing well. I believe. I believe she might be crossing that tape anytime now. I believe she might be crossing that finish line anytime now. And I'm glad. I'm happy to know that when she crosses that finish line and breaks that tape, that right there is going to be the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ, man. And, and for all of eternity, she's going to be running. She's going to be shouting. You talking about joy? You talk about joy? Uh, unspeakable joy? We, we have no idea. Wait until you get there. Mm. Now, listen. How many of you know you're going to heaven? Amen. But how many of you really didn't think about it much this week? Be honest. That's the problem. That's the problem. 
you're going to heaven. And you don't even think about it. Over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19, Paul says, For what is our joy? What is our, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? For you are our, our rejoicing, you're our crown, you're our joy. Hey, Christians, you're our joy. Hey, in the day of Christ, we're all going to see Jesus. That ought to give us joy. That ought to make us want to run and shout just a little bit. Come on now. Uh, Romans 15, uh, verse uh, 3, Paul says, Now the God of all hope fill you with all joy in believing. It's that hope. It's the hope of heaven that gives us that joy. Let me ask you something. When are you going to heaven? And I don't mean like, what time are you going to die? But when are you going to heaven as a Christian? Were you going to heaven this morning? Right, are you going to heaven now? This evening, will you be going to heaven? Tomorrow, will you be going to heaven? When you go to bed, are you going to be going to heaven? When you wake up in the morning, are you going to heaven? When are you, since the day you've been saved, not been going to heaven? Then when should you not be rejoicing? I mean, really, think about it. You're going to heaven. How can you not rejoice? When can we have joy? Man, I can remember sometimes when I was in, uh, at, at going through the Bible Institute over in Pensacola. And Wednesday nights, they'd have a hymn sing. We'd go out, we'd pray, we'd get done praying. We're already kind of filled with the Holy Ghost. And we get in there and uh, just start singing. And just start shouting and praising God. And start singing and all of a sudden singing about arise my soul. Singing about heaven. And man, that thing get real in there, buddy. Woo-hoo now. I'll tell you what, just let go. Just let loose. Wow. Nothing like where you actually, it's real to you. I mean, where you're really, you're visualizing you're in heaven. There's Jesus on the throne and you're around the throne and all the angels. And I mean, you're, you can see it. It's right there. It's real. See? And you know what? When you're like that, you can't help but have joy. You see, the devil, he's a killjoy. Amen. He's a killjoy. But I can remember sometimes at different revival meetings and stuff, Brother Rex Harrison get up there and start playing. And he would do this whole medley on heaven. Man, he'd get about halfway through that thing, and it'd get going. I mean, it would get real. It'd get thick in there. Lord, show up. Why? Everybody, listen, everybody was thinking about it. Everybody was looking forward to it. Everybody had their hearts and their minds off of all the garbage, off of all the nonsense, off of all the vanity and all the things that come to nothing. And they were thinking about what's real for us. You know what's real for us? We are going to heaven. And when all God's people just kind of get together and they see it in that way and it becomes that real to them, God just shows up and there's such a joy. There's crying everywhere, but it's not, it's not, it's not tears of, of terror or sorrow. It is tears of rejoicing. Hey, think about it. Where are we going? We're going to a wedding. We're going to a wedding. What's, what do we, hey, we're not going to a funeral. We're going to a wedding. Hey Amen. It ain't a time to be, oh, dun, 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 dun. No, it's dun, 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 dun. it's a wedding. You ought to be rejoicing. Amen. You ought to be happy. We're looking forward to meeting the bridegroom. Preacher got up one time and, and he said, uh, I've noticed through my years that uh, most young ladies, when they get married, marry a man just like their father. And then a young lady out in the audience said, is that why the mothers are always crying? Amen. Yeah. Hey, uh, think about it. You're going to heaven. I'm sorry to remind you of that this morning. Maybe I bursted your bubble. You're going to heaven. You ought to be rejoicing. Is it God's will for you to rejoice? Then why haven't you been? Isn't God mean? God must have an ulterior motive. Yeah, he wants you to have joy. Isn't he mean? Listen. She comes up and plays that piano for the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe that gave joy to God. I don't think God was up there saying, well, she missed a few notes. She comes up and sings. Oh, her voice cracked. God's like, oh, forget it. No. 
that ain't God. Amen? Is that what we're doing it for? Oh, no, we're doing it for him. Hey, because we know we're going to heaven. We got something to rejoice at. You ought to be rejoicing now. Come on. Look what he says. Look back there in Luke chapter 10. It's God's desire for us to have fullness of joy. You can't miss that thing. Do you have it? Do you have it? You ought to. Hey, need to get the shout back. Christian, need to get the joy back. Watch out for that kill joy. He's trying to rob you of your joy. He's trying to spoil you. Don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. Look back here, verse 21, verse 21. Luke 10, verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, but hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are to deliver me and my Father, and no man knoweth whom the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned, he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are your eyes which see the things that ye see. I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see the things which you see and have not seen them. And to hear the things which you hear and have not heard them. Hey, we ought to rejoice because of the revelations from God's word that we receive. People in the Old Testament, they couldn't get it. We get it. We can go into this book, brethren. Now listen, we can go into this book. right. Turn with me to Psalm 119. We can go into this book right here and get some joy. You ever just go into this book and God show you something? God open your eyes to something. God reveal something to you. And it just, man, it just makes you just start doing somersaults tum in your heart. You're just, you're just doing flips. You're just rejoicing. Hallelujah. Look what the Lord showed me. Look what God put in here just for me. Amen. You ever done that? You ever just go in the Bible and then God just say, look at that. Wow. Yeah. And then you start comparing. You start looking around. Man, you're out running rabbit trails, getting studied. And the Lord is just showing you something. Out of it. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Listen, that'll put joy in your heart. Oh, the word of God will put joy in your heart. Now look there in Psalm 119, verse 162. Uh, notice what David said. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Hey, you imagine going out and start just digging a hole in your backyard and next thing you know, boom, here's buried treasure and you find yourself, I don't know, say, you know, 200 pounds of gold. I don't know what that's worth, but that's probably a lot of money these days. Amen. And you do that and chink, what is that? Boop, you bring that thing up. You can't even pull it up. It's so heavy. You got to get a couple people to help you take that thing up and you open up gold and silver and jewels and all like that. And you do that and you open that thing up and you say, well, that's rather interesting. Let's go have lunch. Huh? What would you be doing? Come on. Some of you. What's going to happen if you do hit the lottery? Huh? Now, uh, come on. All right. I know some of you are playing. No, whatever. You know. Say, but I'm going to give it to the church. Don't tell us where it came from. Now, listen. Amen. Um, just don't tell us where it came from. Ignorance is bliss. But if you come in saying, oh, I won this in the lottery. No, nope, can't take it. Sorry. Dummy, should have kept your mouth shut. Amen. Now, I just, in case it ever happens, I'm covered. That's liability. <laughs> Insurance. Right. Now, uh, where was I? Now, you got me all off track. I was, where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going to hit the lottery, and you're going to hit the lottery, and you're going to say, oh, they all match. Well, that's something. I wonder what's on the radio. Now, I know what you're going to be doing. You're going to be running around the block. Oh, yeah. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo! And the preacher gets up and preaches, and they sing about heaven, and you're thinking, man, I wonder what time the restaurant's going to close. Where's your joy? Where's your joy? You can't get joy out of this book. Remember when you used to? Look in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah 15. Oh, praise the Lord. I can remember when God first showed me that thing about glory and shame. 
And that thing all started opening up. And I started doing a little study on that. Put together a message. It was just never ending, man. It was just so good. It's good when the Lord does that, when it just shows you something. Nobody else had ever taught it. Nobody else had ever preached it. But there it is, and it's real, and it's true. And it's good. Man, it caused you to rejoice. God showed me that thing on the fig tree. God opened some stuff up there in 1 John 5 for me that I could never understand. All of a sudden, boom, there it was. Isn't that good when God just take the Bible and all of a sudden just say, look, here. Give you light on the scripture. It ought to make you rejoice. It ought to make you shout, man. It ought to make you do some somersaults in your heart there. Look, look there in Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. Notice what the prophet Jeremiah said. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. You know where Jeremiah got his joy? You know where Jeremiah got his rejoicing? From the word of God. Come on. Hey, maybe you're not able to go out and tell someone about the Lord. It's late at night, whatever. You can't go tell someone about Jesus. Uh, you're trying to think about heaven, but you just don't feel like you got any. Just get in that book. Just get in that book, man. Why don't you get some joy? You don't have to be miserable your whole lives. You know what happens? This is what happens. Follow with me now. Christians, they kind of get out of the will of God. They get away from God. They don't have that joy anymore. And then you know what they start doing? They start reaching out to other things to try to find that joy. Instead of getting back where they came from. Instead of tracing their steps. And figuring out what they need to repent of. Where they need to get back. Where they can have that joy they had. Where they can have that fellowship that they had. And they don't want to face the music. See? And that's the final thing here. If you'll look with me there. Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We'll be done just a little bit here. Stay with me. Luke chapter 10. Last point. Last point to our conclusion. We'll be done. Luke chapter 10. Look at me in verse 21. Verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced. Why is he rejoicing? In spirit. And said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. That thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them on the babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. You know what Jesus had right there? He had perfect communion, perfect fellowship with God. That's why he could rejoice. You know what he wants for you and I? Same thing. Perfect fellowship. You know where you lose your joy? Right there. When you lose that walk, when that personal fellowship with Jesus Christ, you don't have it like you used to. You're not walking with him the way you used to. He's not real to you the way you used to be. You don't look forward to serving God the way you used to. You're enduring it. You're struggling. Instead of walking on air, you're running through quicksand. And you're getting nowhere. It's because you lost your fellowship. And the Lord wants that fellowship restored. See? Look back there in Psalm 16. Let me show you. It's real plain in the Bible. Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Stay with me now. Just a few more verses. Psalm 16. It's important, though. You need to get this. Yeah, Brother Ray, I know. I know what you're trying to do. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to get you to have joy. Would you forgive me? Psalm 16. Look with me in Psalm 16 and verse 11. Thou will show me the path of life in thy presence is, is what? Fullness of joy. That's where it's found. That's where it is. It's in his presence. That's why you haven't had it. That's why you have to fake it. Because you haven't been walking with God. And he's calling you. He's asking you to get back in fellowship with him. Don't you want to be in fellowship with him? Isn't it good to be in fellowship with him? Then what's stopping it? Or who's stopping it? Come on. What's there? What's in the way? Get it. Get it. See it. See it. Ask God to give you light on it. Lord, what's in the way of me getting back in fellowship with you? God will show you if you want to see it.
1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1. He heard a preacher say a long time ago, best advice I probably ever got, he says, keep short list with God. Keep a short list with God. What's he saying? He's talking about 1 John chapter 1. Look at verse 9, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You know what the Lord says? You know why he's telling us that? He, he already told you why he told you that. Look back in verse 4. These things write we unto you. Why? That your joy may be full. And you know what he's talking about in that whole thing? It's your fellowship with Jesus Christ. Walking in the light. Walking in fellowship with God. What gets you out of that? Sin. But he tells you what to do. He tells you what to do. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, there's two problems. One, you're not confessing. Or two, you're confessing. And by confessing, we're saying, okay, I've seen that thing, God, that's wrong. And you're turning back to God now. And you're saying, now, Lord, I did this. Help me not to do that anymore. Amen? And you're bringing that thing to God and you're showing it to God. It's not this, well, Lord, I'm in the middle of uh, committing fornication. Just figure I confess it while I'm doing it. And it don't work that way. Nice try. Amen? But when there's a true confession, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, here, look what I've done. Lord, help me and show me how I won't do this again. When, when is that? You know what the Lord said? He's faithful and just to forgive you of all sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Isn't that what he said? So number one, you haven't done that. Or number two, you've done it, but you don't believe it. And either of those two will rob you of your joy. There's a killjoy out there. There's been something, then someone, he's, he's like a roaring lion. He's like a serpent. He's like an angel of light. He's, he's like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And he's out there to do one thing. Spoil you of your joy. And let's face it, he's been doing a pretty good job at it, hasn't he? Now, what you going to do? You see, the devil knows something you don't. But I can remember some times of prayer. Look back there with me in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. I can remember some times of prayer, either sometimes by myself, sometimes in a prayer meeting with some other preachers or something. But we just pray it and God gets so real and so sweet and so good. I need to have a time like that. I haven't had a time like that in a while. I got to get back to that. Amen. How about you? In thy presence is what? What? Some of you haven't been around God's presence much lately. Now, you've made that obvious, haven't you? You don't have any joy, so you must not have been around his presence. Because you can't help being around the presence of God and not have joy. It's like a disease. It'll catch you. It's catchy. It'll, it'll get you. It'll get all over you. You get around God, you get in his presence, you're going to have joy. Automatic. That's why he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. You can't help it. You get full of God. You get around God and his presence, you're going to have joy. You can't help it. That's God's will for your life. Why do you fight that? Ask yourself. What's, what is it about me that I don't want to have joy? My God. Is that perverted or what? Look with me in Nehemiah uh, did I, uh, chapter 8. Did I tell you what chapter? Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. 
Now look at this. Here's Israel, and God brings judgment on them. They'd messed up big time. Amen? You've got Nehemiah and Ezra, and they're trying to get the temple restored and get the people back to living for God, get the temple going again, get back to the way things used to be. Verse 9, And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Amen. Mourn not. Say, what have they been doing? They've been weeping. They've been mourning. Sackcloth, ashes, oh God. We've done wickedly, we've done wrong. And you know what the preachers get up and tell them? All right, good. You've admitted that. Now get over it. You know what the devil do with some of you? I'm telling you, I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it. You get messed up, you fall, and then you just want to wallow in it. Instead of just getting right with God, getting back on your feet and going on. But when you do, the devil's there the whole time, the accuser of the brethren. God ain't forgave you that. God can't use you anymore. God's tired of you. See, you don't believe God. That's what's going on here with these people. See? And there's a reason for it. The devil knows something that maybe you don't. Look here at verse, uh, where are we at? Verse 9. Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink the sweet. Hallelujah. Isn't that fattening? Yep. Glory to God. It's time of rejoicing. Hey, it's a time of rejoicing. And send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be sorry. Why? Why? What's he telling them? For, watch it, the joy of the Lord is your strength. What's your strength, Christian? How are you going to win the victory? How are you going to win the battle? You're going to have to have strength. You think the devil knows that? So what does he have to do to rob you of your strength? Just rob you of your joy. And where's that found? Well, that's found rejoicing in the word of God. That's found in telling others about Jesus. That's found by getting our hearts and minds off all the cares and the affairs and the hassles and the problems of this life and getting them focused on what's real. And that's found when we'll just have a walk with God. And when we confess our sins and get right, get back in fellowship. And every time we mess up, we get right back in there. And not feeling sorry for ourselves, not down in the mouth, but get right back up in it. Get right back up in there, right next to God again. That's where he wants us. If we're in his presence, see, we'll have joy. We'll have fullness of joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. All we have to concentrate on, now think about it, all we have to concentrate on is our fellowship with God. Not all the rest of it. we got all this here. But listen, if you just have that fellowship with God, aren't you going to want to tell others about Jesus? Aren't you going to be in the Bible and God show things to you? Aren't you going to have your heart and mind focused on heaven? You see, it's all based on that. The devil knows that, man. It's that one thing right there. Your fellowship with Jesus Christ. Because when that's right, everything else will be right. Because right there is where the joy is. And where the joy is, the strength is. And where the strength is, the victory is. How to have joy. Maybe you need to get it back. Maybe you got it. Don't lose it. Why wouldn't you want to have it? Let's stand for prayer.
Father, I pray you bless the message. I, I don't know what else to say on the subject, Lord. I believe I've spoken what you've given me to say. I pray for your people. And uh, it's disheartening sometimes, Lord. You see people that are saved on their way to heaven. And you just see them so down in the mouth and so miserable at times. I, I just pray, God, that uh, help us as your people to get the joy back. Get stirred up. Uh, Father, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Lord, have that joy that only comes from walking in the very presence of a holy and pure and blessed Savior. We thank you for that privilege of fellowship with thee, Lord. And pray that we'd all desire, we'd all seek for it, want it. And we thank you for the joy, Lord, that you do give to us. In the midst of all that's going on down here and all the problems and all the junk, that we can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Father, I thank you for that. I pray you'd have your way in hearts. And uh, Lord, you just have your way in the service now. I ask and pray it in Jesus' name as we continue in prayer. The altar's open. Some have come. Would you like to come to the altar? Maybe there's just something you need to get right and you want to get back in fellowship and get that joy back. You remember? Remember what you used to have? Don't you want that joy? Hmm? How about it? God spoke in your heart. Why don't you just come? Maybe you got it. You just don't want to lose it. <laughs> Say, Lord, I don't want to lose it. Help me not to lose it. I want to keep it. You come on down. Let God have his way in service. Amen. You know, that's one of the things, honestly, for me, that I hate about sin the most. It'd be nice <laughs> if we could sin and then still have that fellowship with the Lord. Wouldn't that be nice? But it don't work that way. It don't work that way. And, but the Lord said what to do. You've got to get it right. Speak to God about it. Have a one-on-one, -on -one, a real deal thing with God. Amen. When's the last time you've done that? When's the last time you just poured it all out to God? And said, God, here. Now, God, you cleanse me. God, I, I'm not getting up until I know that everything's right between me and you. And that word in fellowship, Lord, I want that joy. I don't want, listen, I don't want to have to go on my strength. I want to go on yours. You're only going to go on his. If you have that joy, the joy of the Lord. Unspeakable. Full of glory. Brother Nate, would you close us in prayer?